Hi, I'm Caprice and welcome back to the Unseen Podcast, a podcast dedicated to UK missing people. This is our series on the disappearance of the infamous Lord Lucan. Now if you haven't listened to the first episode, The Missing Lord, please go back and listen to it so that you're all caught up. Please be advised that the episodes in this series deal with violence, so use your own discretion when listening to them. Today we are going to explore what happened immediately after Lord Lucan fled and went to visit his friends, the Maxwell Scots, in Uckfield, East Sussex. Last episode, the police had just arrived at 46 Lower Belgrave Street and encountered the dead body of Sandra Rivett in the basement kitchen of the property. Lady Veronica Lucan had called the alarm at the nearby pub, the Plumber's Arms, and police had been dispatched. The detective in charge of the investigation was Detective Chief Superintendent Roy Ranson. He headed up the investigation and arrived in the early hours of Friday the 8th of November. He had already ensured that forensic officers and photographers were on their way to the property and the crime scene had been sealed off. The divisional surgeon had taken a look at Sandra's body and had pronounced her dead at the scene. The crime scene at first glance did not appear to be chaotic or in much disarray. There was no sign of forced entry except the front door, which had been kicked in by police officers to gain entry. Aside from this, the house looked to be undisturbed from the outside. The basement, however, was a different story. The area around the top of the basement stairs contained heavy bloodstains and a lead pipe covered in blood was found. On the staircase, pictures hanging on the walls were askew and the metal banister rail was damaged. On arriving at the foot of the stairs, two cups and saucers were found lying in a pool of blood on the floor. It was noted that a light bulb from the fitting at the bottom of the stairs had been taken out and placed onto a cushion in the kitchen. It was also suspected that this was to hide the killer's face during the attack. Leaves on bushes in the adjoining garden were also found to have blood on them. The police officers looked closely at the body of Sandra Rivett, which was lying in a pool of blood inside the canvas mail sack, as Lady Lucan had described. From the pictures of the crime scene, we can understand how Sandra Rivett's body was positioned. The photographs were taken in black and white by police photographer Graham Shilton. Mrs Rivett's body was placed feet first in the mail sack and her hand and arm were falling out of it. Graham Chilton later said in an interview that the body was in a passageway at the bottom of the stairs. It was a small sack. It does seem incredible that a body can be put in a sack that size. The pictures also show that the blood had seeped out of the sack and onto the kitchen floor. Sandra's black patent shoes were also placed on the floor near her body. The crime scene was gruesome, and the officers got to wondering if Lord Lucan was capable of committing such a terrible murder. After the pathologist Keith Simpson removed the body from the sack and undertook a post-mortem examination, he established that Sandra's body had been placed into the sack after she had been killed, and that the murder weapon could have been the pipe that was found at the top of the basement stairs. The officers went straight to Lord Lucan's address after speaking with his mother, who had called to take the children to her house. Nothing suspicious was found at his address. Laid out on his bed was a suit, a shirt and a book about Greek shipping millionaires. On the bedside table, officers found his wallet, car keys, driving licence, handkerchief and spectacles. Lucan had also left behind his passport, which the officers found in a drawer, and his blue Mercedes-Benz. This was parked outside his house, and the battery was flat, although it had been known that he'd been having problems with the battery for a number of weeks. With nothing except Lady Lucan's testimony, it was indeed her husband who had killed Sandra Rivett. The officers started to look into other suspects as well. Gardens, skips, basements and other open spaces were searched thoroughly in the hope of finding other evidence in relation to the case. 
the officers also began to look into Sandra's background. They interviewed Sandra's estranged husband, Roger Rivett. He had an alibi for the evening, and therefore he was dismissed as a potential suspect. They also interviewed other male friends, ex-colleagues and boyfriends of hers. Nothing suspicious came up from these interviews, and after questioning, these suspects were discounted by police. They were also to find out that Sandra was very hard-working and enjoyed working for Lady Lucan. The two women had a good working relationship and Sandra loved the children. The investigation was floundering without a solid suspect and Lord Lucan did not look like he was going to appear any time soon. The police circulated a description of Lucan to police forces across the country and newspapers and media outlets were told that they would like him to come in for questioning. By the afternoon of Friday the 8th of November, the story of the murder had well and truly broken, and the entire nation knew about the crime and Lucan's possible involvement. The papers ran front-page stories about the crime, with headlines such as Body in Sack, Countess Runs Out Screaming. The reports named Lucan as a suspect, and this piled pressure upon the police to find him as soon as possible. That day a meeting was arranged at the Claremont Club by some of Lucan's closest friends, including John Aspinall, Bill Shandkid, Dominic Ells and Daniel Minershagen. The police saw this as somewhat suspicious, accusing the group of as being an Eton Mafia against the police. The relationship between the police and Lucan's friends and associates was becoming very strained, and both felt that the other was not being helpful in the case. The friends insisted that it was just a gathering of concerned friends and that there was nothing untoward happening. Meanwhile, Lucan was in Uckfield in East Sussex, staying with his friends, the Maxwell Scots. He rang his mother at 12.30am on the morning of Friday the 8th of November and had explained that he would ring her later. He refused to speak to the police constable who had accompanied his mother back to her house and said he would speak to them himself. Ian Maxwell Scott had alerted Detective Chief Inspector Roy Ranson about Lucan's appearance in Uckfield and informed him that he had arrived a few hours after the murder. Lucan wrote two letters to his brother-in-law, Bill Shand Kidd, while he was there, and sent them both to his London address. The first letter was dated the 7th of November 1974. The letter read, Dear Bill, the most ghastly circumstances arose tonight which I briefly described to my mother. When I interrupted the fight at Lower Belgrave Street and the man left, Veronica accused me of having hired him. I took her upstairs and sent Frances up to bed and tried to clean her up. She lay doggo for a bit and when I was in the bathroom, left the house. The circumstantial evidence against me is strong in that Veronica will say it was all my doing. I will also lie doggo for a bit but I am concerned for the children. If you can manage it, I want them to live with you. Coots, St Martin's Lane will handle school fees Veronica has demonstrated her hatred for me in the past and would do anything to see me accused. For George and Francis to go through life knowing their father had stood in the dock for attempted murder would be too much. When they are old enough to understand, explain to them the dream of paranoia and look after them. Yours ever, John. The second was not dated but merely set out his financial arrangements and was headed financial matters. There is a sale coming up at Christie's November the 27th, which will satisfy bank overdrafts. Please agree reserves with Tom Craig. Proceeds to go to Lloyd's, six Pall Mall. Coots, 59 Strand. NatWest, Bloomsbury Branch, who also hold an equity and life law policy. The other creditors can get lost for the time being. Lucky. Ian Maxwell Scott informed Bill Shand Kidd about the letters that had been sent, and Bill drove to London to pick them up. He read them and suddenly noticed that they were bloodstained. He took them straight to Roy Ranson. 
Susan Maxwell-Scott was also asked why she did not report Lucan's appearance to the police. She explained that she had not seen any news reports and did not think it was odd that he appeared at the house. A description of the Ford Corsair that Lucan had last been driving had been circulated in the media, and two days after, on Sunday the 10th of November, it had been located. The car had been left on Norman Road in New Haven, 16 miles or 26 kilometres from Uckfield. It is thought, after interviewing witnesses, that the car had been parked there for some time, between 5am and 8am on Friday the 8th of November. The police investigated the car thoroughly, and in the boot they found a piece of lead pipe bandaged with tape and a full bottle of vodka. These were taken to be forensically analysed. The owner of the car, Michael Stoop, had also been contacted by Lucan, by letter, just like Bill Shand Kidd. The letter to him read, My dear Michael, I have had a traumatic night of unbelievable coincidence. However, I won't bore you with anything, or involve you except to say that when you come across my children, which I hope you will, please tell them that you knew me, and that all I cared about was them. The fact that a crooked solicitor and a rotten psychiatrist destroyed me between them will be of no importance to the children. I gave Bill Shand Kidd an account of what actually happened, but judging by my last effort in court, no one, let alone a 67-year-old judge, would believe. And I no longer care, except that my children should be protected. Yours ever, John. The letter was delivered to Stoop's club address, the St James, but Stoop had failed to keep the envelope to the letter, and therefore the police were unable to figure out if it had a postmark on it. Since Friday the 8th of November, nobody had seen Lucan, and therefore could not confirm when or where the letter was written. Nobody could also confirm if the witnesses were correct about when the car was parked or if they had seen anybody in the area fitting his description. Without Luke and the police seemed to be at a dead end. The police turned to the forensics for more clues on the guilt of Lord Lucan. They merely had circumstantial evidence up until this point, and in a trial, circumstantial evidence was not going to win them the case. The police ran forensic tests of both lead pipes, the one found at the murder scene and the one found in the car. In the 1970s, forensic tests were very primitive in comparison to today, and most of the time could only point the police in the correct direction. And even then, they needed a viable suspect to compare it to. The forensic evidence was brought forward at the inquest, which began on the 13th of November, 1974. It was a media frenzy, and the courtroom was packed with reporters. After some adjournments, the inquest was suspended until the 16th of June 1975. The forensic evidence was brought forward by Dr Margaret Parira, who had been described in a newspaper from the time as Miss Murder. She explained that the lead pipe that had been found in the house has both blood types A and B on it, both Veronica Lucan's and Sandra Rivett's. The lead pipe in the car had been taped up slightly differently and did not contain any blood at all. Dr Pereira stated that there were bloodstains on the door of the car, on both seats and on the wheel and dashboard. Dr Pereira explained that this blood was a match to both women. She also explained that she had examined blood samples from the Belgravia crime scene and had established that Group A blood, Lady Lucan's, was found at the top of the basement stairs, and Group B blood, Sandra Rivets, had been found at the bottom, in the basement. Having looked at other blood samples throughout the house, she also found splashes and smears on the passageway walls down to the basement. She concluded that this would be from someone striking and hitting a wound that was already bleeding. According to Dr Pereira, the scene was very violent and did not appear to be the scene that Lord Lucan had described in his letters. 
His ability to see into the basement as he was driving past was also brought into question during the inquest. Inspector Gehring, who was also on the scene testing Lucan's story, he explained that only by stooping his head between 60 centimetres and a metre could he make out the figure of a fellow police officer in the basement. This appeared to completely contradict Lucan's story. Michael Stoop was shown the lead pipe from his Ford Corsair. He also stated that there had been nothing in the car like that when he had had it. He explained that Lucan had asked to borrow the car on October the 25th, 1974, 13 days before the murder. Stoop had, had offered him his Mercedes-Benz because the Ford was scruffy, but he had declined. Stoop put this down to manners and explained that he was sure that Lucan just didn't want to take his best car. The Home Office were unable to confirm if the pipe found at the crime scene and the one found in the Ford Corsair were cut from the same length of pipe. They also couldn't confirm if the tape that was around the pipe was the same, however they believed it was similar. Hair belonging to Lady Lucan was found on the pipe at the Lower Belgravia Street. It was also later proven that the bloodstained letter that Lord Lucan sent to Bill Shand Kidd contained the blood of both women. While the letter he later sent to Michael Stoop did not have blood on it, it was concluded to have been written on a notepad that was found in the boot of the Ford Corsair. The inquest into Sandra Rivett's death was led by the coroner, Gavin Thurston, and he brought forward 33 witnesses over a few days. One of the witnesses was Sandra Rivett's husband, Roger, who testified that he had identified his, wife, his wife's body. The pathologist, Keith Simpson, also testified that Sandra had head injuries consistent with a blunt instrument. He confirmed that Sandra Rivett had died due to blunt force injuries and an inhalation of blood. He also explained that Sandra's injuries were most likely caused by the lead pipe, but some to the left eye and mouth could have been caused by a clenched fist. One of the witnesses, Susan Maxwell Scott, the last known person to have seen Lord Lucan, described his appearance as dishevelled and his hair a little ruffled. She described that he had a damp patch on his trousers near his right hip. She also gave the jury another account that she was told by Lord Lucan when he arrived in Uckfield. She explained that Lucan had told her he was walking or passing by the house when he saw Veronica being attacked by a man. He said he let himself in, but he slipped in a pool of blood at the bottom of the stairs. He then told her that the attacker ran off and that his wife was hysterical and then accused him of hiring a hitman to kill her. This would be another account of what had happened that day, although was similar, did have some discrepancies to other stories he had told about the events. Lady Lucan was a key part of the testimony, having been the one to raise the alarm for the murder, and having allegedly fought with her husband. Veronica Lucan was questioned about her husband, their employment of Sandra, and their financial affairs. The Dowager Countess's Queen Counsel, who was taking part of the questioning, began to ask Lady Lucan about her relationship with her husband, and whether she hated him. The coroner, Gavin Thurston, ruled this line of questioning inadmissible, and Lady Lucan did not answer. The inquest also took into account the testimony of the Lucan's eldest daughter, Frances. Her statement was read out to the jury by a detective constable. Francis had told this detective constable on the 20th of November 1974 that she had first heard a scream. After a few minutes she had watched as her mother with blood on her face and her father had come upstairs and entered the room. Her mother sent her to bed and then she later heard her father calling for her mother. He then left the house. Francis also explained how Sandra did not normally work on a Thursday. The inquest also included testimony from the landlord at the Plumber's Arms, 
who explained how Veronica Lucan had entered the pub and was covered head to toe in blood. She was in complete shock, and he claimed that she shouted, Help me, help me, I've just escaped being murdered. He also claims that she said, My children, my children, he's murdered my nanny. The hearing came to an end, and the coroner made a landmark ruling. He stated that, I will record that Sandra Eleanor Rivett died from head injuries, but at 10.30pm on the 7th of November 1974, she was found dead at 46 Lower Belgrave Street, and that the following offence was committed by Richard John Bingham, Earl of Lucan, namely the offence of murder. This meant that Lord Lucan was the first member of the House of Lords to be named a murderer since 1760. He was also the last person to be committed by the coroner for unlawful killing. The coroner's power to do this was taken away by the Criminal Law Act in 1977. Lucan also now became not just a missing person, but also a murderer, who in his absence was not able to explain himself. Lucan's defence pled his innocence in his absence and believed the inquest to give only a one-sided view of the situation. Lucan's mother explained that the inquest had no useful purpose at all, and Susan Maxwell Scott explained her sadness about it all and continued to press Lord Lucan's innocence. She said she was awfully sorry for the Countess, while others expressed that Sandra Rivett's story had been lost Sandra's body was cremated in December 1974, before the inquest had started. However, Lady Lucan did not attend the cremation, citing not wanting to upset the family for her reason for not attending. Lord Lucan continued to be vilified in the press and named as Sandra's murderer, despite threats to sue for libel by the defence. The case was not looking good for Lucan, and evidence was stacking up against him. Without his presence, it was becoming increasingly difficult for people to stand up for him. The only explanation that was provided by Lucan was from the letters that he sent while on the run after the murder had occurred. Many thought that it was just an unbelievable and impossible situation, that Lucan had simply come across the scene due to the position he would have had to take in the road to see into the basement kitchen. Lucan's fingerprints were not found at the scene, however there was still the matter of how similar the lead pipe was in the boot of the Ford Corsair, and the blood on the letters that had been sent to Michael Stoop and Bill Shand Kidd. The lack of another viable suspect was also a problem for Lord Lucan. There was no sign of forced entry at the house, the front door of the basement was locked and had not been tampered with. Also, no exit could have been made through the rear door, as it led to a walled garden, where no sign of an exit were found. Nobody in the area noticed anyone suspicious exiting through the main front door of the house, or in the general area. It would seem that it was a mystery. A mystery that was compounded by the fact that the main suspect was nowhere to be found. The question still remained that Lord Lucan was unaccounted for. Did something happen to Lord Lucan to make him disappear? Did he kill himself? Or did he simply make himself disappear on purpose to avoid detection? These questions have been unanswered for over 40 years, and during this time, there have been a number of theories, both plausible and somewhat on the wild side. Next episode, we will be diving headfirst into all the theories involved in his disappearance, possible sightings and recent thoughts on the case from those involved. Once again, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Unseen. It has been a pleasure to have lots of people engaged in the story, and I hope you come back next week to listen to the third instalment. Believe me, there are still so many twists and turns. Please contact us on Twitter or on Facebook at The Unseen Pod. And please.